One thing about music and film and television is it reaches audiences that I may never encounter as a human being. You know, I may not ever reach certain parts of the earth, but these forms of media will. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dalski. And I'm Rudy Sallow. And this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates. Today's episode is a lot of fun. This is one of my favorite topics. I love talking about film. I love talking about superheroes and how they connect to philosophy. Our guest is Dr. Darius Benton. He's a professor of communication studies at the University of Houston. And I had a chance to meet him at an academic conference. It was virtual, uh, the HERA conference. It's uh, Humanities Education Research Association. And he wrote a paper Well, after getting to know him, I found out that he wrote a paper called Hero or Villain, a character and content analysis of Eric Killmonger from the film Black Panther. So of course I had to read it and invite him on the pod because I love these kinds of questions about the moral tales in hero films, superhero films, right? Superhero Uh, films, comics? I don't know. Everything's the MCU. Rudy, you're the expert on this. (laughs) There's the MCU, you know, the Marvel comic universe, and there's the DC comic book. It seems like everything is a comic book movie these days. Not a bad thing because I grew up a comic book fan. And I really wish I could have talked more on this episode because it was on a topic that is near and dear in my heart, hero or villain, because... Lately, these days, in a lot of the acting roles that I've been getting, I've been playing the villain. And to play a proper villain, you have to get into the villain's head and you have to get into the villain's psyche. And yes, it's very difficult to do in the type of villains that I have been playing. But when he was discussing Eric Killmonger, I'll tell you, I really started to rethink a lot of things about that particular villain and and what that villain in the movie and in the comic books portrayed. And I think that's the skill. It's just like, put yourself into that person's shoes and see the world through their eyes before kind of passing judgment and passing a category of hero or villain. Went very, very well on this episode. I, like I said, I wish I could speak more on it. We recorded this due to some scheduling changes and some other things. Unfortunately, during a time, it was a funeral, it was my dad's cousin. It was, uh, we called him Uncle Eddie. And, you know, I was at the memorial service. So I, I don't say much on the episode. And in fact, you know what? I didn't need to. The guest was excellent. The topic was excellent. I just sat there and learned a lot about Eric Killmonger and what really is a hero? What really is a villain? I loved it. I mean, I remember watching Black Panther and I enjoyed the film. And what I liked about Darius's paper is that it made me rethink, wait a minute, what was going on there? And his analysis with the sociocultural reality of Black America and what it has, what it means to have an all Black cast, a variety of characters, different backgrounds, women characters. It was just really fascinating. And I remember thinking at the end of the film that I didn't think that the film had made a very clear commentary on rightness or wrongness. And Darius, I I mean, it was one of those things that was kind of in the back of my mind, but Darius really works that out and explains why. And that why is fascinating. And it really brings light to the uniqueness of the film and what we can learn from this film. So it was an absolute joy to have him on the pod. It was. I mean, and when Black Panther came out, I wasn't into the MCU that much. And I think Kate and I went and watched it in the movie theater. We were blown away. We loved it. And as he was speaking about it, and as he was talking about the ending of the film and why that really is a recasting of, you know, what Eric Killmonger stood for and what happened at the end of that film, really, it just it just shown the light on the brilliance of the film Black Panther. Yeah. And do you want to do a dedication? Uh, Yeah, you know, this episode is dedicated to, you know, Uncle Eddie. Got to know you later on in my life, but uh, obviously was there and wanted to to be there at the the memorial and still wanted to do part of my duties here as as the co-host. So this is, this is dedicated to him. To Uncle Eddie. Uh, To Uncle Eddie. Okay. All right. Let's talk Black Panther. Darius, welcome to the show. Thank you. I noticed you're teaching your your communications department, correct? Correct. You have a background in divinity. I do. (laughs) Can I, is it okay if we start there? I just want to know. Absolutely. How did you go from divinity to communications? And does your work in communications, do you find your background in divinity working its way through communications? 
Absolutely. So I started off as a mass communication major. So when I went to college, my goal and ambition in life was to be a news anchor. But once I got into the field, although I love television, I love broadcasting, I love radio, I realized news was a little bit too hard for me. Um, you know, doing those internships, you realize that you know, going in, getting a story and leaving, that wasn't my personality type. I would go home thinking about the people. I wanted to do something positive to help and make a change. Um, I also was growing in my spirituality during that time throughout college. And I realized I wanted to have a life of service, particularly when it came to, you know, religious service, particularly in the Christian church. And so uh, while I was in, I think it was like Murray College, I started substituting and I became a youth minister at my church. That led me into pursuing theological studies directly after graduating with my undergrad. So I went through this process of praying and like, all right, if I get into grad school, I'll go. If not, I'm going to work for BT or MTV and, you know, pursue this life in television. I got into grad school and I was just like, all right, well, let's keep it going. So I went to grad school. My mindset then was to go into creating content that was educational, but also faith-based for youth and children. Of course, one of my mentors in graduate school told me, well, told all of us, we probably would, what we thought we wanted to do, by the time we graduated, we wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> so I was like, not going to have again. I already have one degree I'm not using. I won't have to. Long story short, we graduating. This is at the time of the reset, the big recession in around 08, when that big recession hit and the housing market crashed and all of that. So it was very difficult to find jobs. But I also realized during that time that I had a heart and a passion for young people that weren't necessarily church-based. So I ended up working um, in the school district. I got hired as a graduation coach, which was like, a perfect fit position for me at that time because I was working on basically building interventions for students who um, had challenges. I, long story short, I ended up working in some very difficult schools in Atlanta, some of the schools where students were forgotten about, left behind. Even in No Child Left Behind, they were left behind in their own ways. And I got to work with some incredible educators. It really opened my mind, my eyes up to what life looked like for other people other than myself. And it really formed a passion for, you know, creating voice and opportunity for young people. And so I ended up moving out of that into um, pursuing a PhD. Um, and then that ended up, so long story short, <laughs> I bring all of that together to say <laughs> that um, I ended up coming back around to communication because essentially communication is in every single thing that we do. I was able to tie everything that I study, everything I do into communication in some way, form, or fashion. It's times when um, you know people ask me, well, what is your research interest or what is your research um, trajectory? And I'm like, I really don't know. It depends on what's happening in the world. And that's kind of how I ended up writing this piece on Black Panther was that it was something that was happening in the world. It hit a trigger in me that I needed to respond and give voice to possibly the voiceless or the voice that was overlooked in this particular film. A lot of work that's done on, let's say, superhero films, I think there's an analysis of the hero and mm -hmm. you have more of their moral dilemmas and you have this analysis of Killmonger of the supposed villain. When did you have this idea to write this paper? Was it as soon as you finished watching the film, was it a week later or what struck you and you just thought, I need to explore this? So I, I went to see the movie like two times in the theater and then I was watching something It may have been on Entertainment Tonight or some, you know, some program that was talking about the film. They said, you know, Marvel's most hated villain, Eric Killmonger. And I was like, wait, what? Because I didn't consider him to be the villain. I had no concept <laughs> or even thought about the fact that he was the villain in the film. I definitely thought he was the antagonist because he, you know, if we put T'Challa in the um, protagonist role. I knew he was like the antagonist. But at the same time, I never really considered him to be necessarily a villain. And I had to figure out why that was. Why is it that others would characterize him a villain, but I wouldn't characterize him a villain. So I actually went and saw the movie again for the third time in the theater. And I understood a little bit more why certain people may think that, but I still didn't feel that way. So I started to then look up some research and say, okay, what is a hero? What is a villain? What these characteristics make up? What are historical villains in film and in comics and those types of things? Because I'm not really a big Marvel fan. I know people may be upset about that, but I never really followed it. Like if I see a good movie out, I go watch it and I move on. So I didn't really follow the series as much. And Black Panther probably was the first one in that series I watched since I've gone back and watched some of the others to learn the story that led up to it. But, you know, later I ended up buying the movie and watching it 
so too many times, I think, to really unpack it and um, pull together the paper that was published. I'm wondering if people want to characterize him as the villain because that's comfortable, because that's a comfortable way of thinking. Like from Star Wars, there's the dark side and then there's the good side. It just evil and then evil in and of itself doesn't exactly have any motivation or reason behind it. It's simply just for its own sake, just to be powerful. And so I think that that's why maybe when you watched it, you were, or when you saw that recap of it, it's somebody just in a very comfortable way of saying, he's the bad guy, here's the good guy, and that's the dichotomy. What I love about your paper is that you show how complicated it is. And so, okay, so (laughs) after I finished your paper, then I started, I mean, I even emailed late because I was just thinking, wait a minute, I don't even think the film takes the position that it's entirely clear that he is evil because of the way that the film ends, that the film seems to have eased up on this dichotomy of it has to be either evil or goodness and shows that there was a, a moral lesson in Killmonger's behavior. Right. Because the thing that I point out, I point out or I try to point out is that it really is about positionality. It's about perspective, because if you look at it from Killmonger's perspective, if you really get into his mind, even though his approach may be violent or maybe not necessarily the friendliest way to go about reaching his goal, his, his, his intentions were actually well-meaning. <laughs> you know, he wanted to do well and help people around the world who were in oppressed systems and that were not the greatest beneficiaries of what the world had to offer. And so he was very educated, you know, he had been military trained. And so a lot of his actions and decisions came out of his military training. Like, okay, so this particular action is okay when it's used for American military benefits, But when it's used for a different purpose, then now it's bad. When you attack established systems, even if it's for a greater good or you feel like it's for a greater good, then one perspective will say, oh, no, this is bad because it's destroying the way our normal way of life is is removing our protections. But for another person, it's like, but we need to remove your protections or we need to highlight that something needs to change. There's a benefit that basically you have what it takes to make a major difference in the world for lives of people around the world, but you want to be selfish and stay in this cocoon forever. And so it it was kind of like Killmonger in his own way broke through that mindset and that mentality to bring Wakanda out of his cocoon to possibly blossom as a butterfly. We don't know what's going to happen in the next series. I don't know. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in part two. It could, you know, completely shift everything that I thought, (laughs) but we'll see. And even like you said, at the end, it's positioned in a way to show the benefit in that conflict. But even at the beginning of the film, we go into it with this narrative of this story of Wakanda. But when we really listen to it and pay attention to that narrative, we realize it's not T'Challa's dad telling him the story of home, but it's Killmonger's dad or Eric's dad telling him the story of home because he was living in California away from his dad's birthplace. You know, he was the only true African-American character in this film, you know, with his dad being a direct African descendant, his mom being American black lady. He grew up in California. He was disconnected. So he was the only one that needed this story to be told to him. T'Challa didn't need the story because T'Challa was living in that story. It's kind of this positionality and this complexity that Kugler and and the other writers and directors build into this story that, like you said, builds a very complex framework if we really take the time to unpack it and look at how these worlds emerge. Yeah, I mean, with by adding the historical and the cultural impact to Killmonger, it showed, I mean, there was almost, I don't know, I, maybe I'm, now I can't tell if this is my own idea or if I'm just influenced by your paper, <laughs> <laughs> that, that goodness almost feels like a luxury mm-hmm. in the film, where I, there, there was a part of me that was thinking that, that being moral and being good is because there was, in Wakanda, there was this that was the avenue that was the inspiration and I was so excited by seeing all of the female characters in there and playing equal roles and then you point out in your essay that that is something that was lacking in Killmonger's life and so I'm starting to think that because he didn't have the luxury of having this space his moral decisions were far more complicated I was thinking when I first saw him come on the screen his entire posture I just thought this is so American. That was the first thing that I thought of. But of yeah. course, you have the the layer here of, let me see, this idea of man versus social responsibility. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you're writing this because it really gave so much more context to 
you know, when I'm looking at him saying he has such an American posture, but it's so important to pay attention to the Black American experience to understand that layer of his character. Yeah. And in that first frame of him, like I talked about this when I gave a presentation um, on this, I think that it's very interesting to point out that when I first saw him in that museum, he looked like he could be a friend of mine. He could be one of my cousins. He could look like somebody I went to college with. You know, he looks like he could be one of my students, (laughs) one of my former students. And so, you know, he wasn't to me, he wasn't threatening. To me, he wasn't intimidating. To me, he just looked like another guy that could be at my Thanksgiving dinner table. And then he was so smart. <laughs> you know, his intelligence was the first thing that, that came forth. And so it's like, it's that conversation of, are you threatened by my presence, my intelligence, my being? Um, now he did, you know, of course, you know, stage a robbery, but it was still br- brilliantly staged. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's still kind of that thing of, what is it about me? that threatens you, that that causes fear for you. It's just those kind of conversations that lean into, and of course, this paper was written, I believe, I think I wrote it before George Floyd, but, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, I did write it before that. So it comes into modern times when you have so many moments of police brutality against Black men, and it's these conversations of, what about me scares you? Why can't a little kid go to the store and buy some Skittles and eliminate and go home and get there safely? You know, why does it have to turn into a situation? In, in so many other situations that we've seen over the years. And so those reported and not. It's just very interesting to just even lean into that a little bit and just think about just that presence that terrifies people. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think because of this issue of this being of of this being a, a Black cast where you have the American versus African cast. And when we're talking about just the contemporary sociological issues, there seems to be I don't know. I don't know what happened years ago where people wanted to say, like, I don't see color. And they made it sound like that was some sort of a good thing. But what happens is that when you say that you're erasing somebody's history, you're Mm -hmm. erasing so many of the factors that bring somebody into being who they are and situational, let's say existential treks that are required because of the body into which you're born. So I guess I just want to know from you, what is the role of, let's say, I guess we've covered it a little bit, but maybe more of how Blackness makes this a unique type of a film that's not just for a Black audience, but it's for, let's say, a white audience. Like, what is something that we can get out of this film that is not in other comic films? Wow. And because it's because it's a Black cast, because we've got an um, African-American and we also have an African culture. So what with that layer, what does that give us? Wow. I don't know if I can fully answer it, but I'll definitely try. I think it gives us perspective. I went to a historically Black college and university, and one of the things that I took away from that experience was the diversity in Blackness, right? That there's not one type of Black. You know, just like there's not one type of white, there's not one type of Latino, Hispanic, there's not one type of Asian. There is so much diversity and excellence in each culture. And I think that this film does a great job of highlighting the diversity and the excellence of a culture, you know, and shows that it's not just one monolithic, it's not just one way. Even when you have the multiple tribes that are represented in Wakanda, you see that there are multiple cultures, multiple lineages of, you know, hierarchical um, authority. You see they dress differently, they present differently, but they unify around a common cause. They all have different perspectives, ideas. They voice them in an organized way in, in the Wakanda setting, but there's still differences. There's still ways of going about making decisions. There's still ways of dealing with conflict. Even I think one of the striking things in the film, spoiler alert, is just even how the, golly, I can't even think of what the tribe was, but the, the tribe that was looked at as the outcast, right? How they ended up oh, yeah. saving the day, you know, the, how they were the outliers. They weren't included in a lot. They were looked at as a problem, but essentially they saved Wakanda, um, <laughs> you know, in their own way and playing their part. And so I think it really speaks to when we come together and we unite, it can be a beautiful picture, regardless of our cultural backgrounds. Um, I think the themes in the film really usurp any type of ethnic or racial barriers. I think that they're, you know, I've talked to people of other backgrounds, you know, I think that they just got, saw a good movie, (laughs) you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't get caught up into what the people look like as much as the fact that it was an amazing movie from beginning to end, you know, the acting, the cinematography, the scripts, everything was 
the music, the wardrobe, every th- part of that movie was done in excellence. And so I think that it really just brought about and probably gave the opportunity for some people to see people of color in a different light that they maybe not have not been able to. But one thing about music and film and television is it reaches audiences that I may never encounter as a human being. You know, I may not ever reach certain parts of the earth, but these forms of media will. And so I think it really allows those moments of recognition so that when someone sees a guy like Killmonger walk into a store in rural America, they don't automatically look at him and, you know, want to shoot him. (laughs) But they say, oh, okay, he's a good guy, you know, or could say that. Or someone that looks like T'Challa or even any of the feminine characters, you know, not to underestimate their power or their roles in the culture. I think that's another thing I point out in the paper is that it's often, it's even challenging for me to accept T'Challa as the hero because he didn't really do anything heroic in my eyes. And in order for Killmonger to be a villain, he has to oppose a hero. So we would have to prove that T'Challa is the hero. But when we really examine the situation, I feel like the women are the hero of the movie, the heroes of the movie, because they essentially saved, <laughs> you know, they put it all together. You know, they constantly had his back. Anytime he fell short, they picked him up. They fought for him. They created technology for him. They really held the movie together. And so not even under, to not underestimate the role that women play in our society beyond bearing children and cooking dinner. You know, and I think that's important conversations that this movie pulls out as well. His sister was so charming. It was his sister, right, who did the, all the technology. Yes. And I remember watching that and thinking, this is just, she, she, you just fall in love with her. She's so <laughs> charming. And that is something that is relatively new in American film and television, where there is a wide range of characters played by actors who are not white, because for a long time, it was just if you were if you were black or Rudy's worked on this and he's Arab American, he's worked on screenplays that simply being Arab American is the character like mm-hmm. that's that's it. So you're denied yeah. the humanity. And I just thought that that was so beautiful in Black Panther. That wasn't the case. It's like you said, I mean, there's <laughs> that being black was not in and of itself the character. It was right. this entire just broad spectrum of humanity and even the way that the women's strength and yeah. intelligence Technology, I mean, I teach engineering classes. There are not that many women in the engineering classes. And why is that? I mean, maybe we're not even showing that as a possibility or what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, even the fact that they gave T'Challa a little sister, not a little brother, that spoke volumes and the way that she rose to the occasion in her own way. She was often the comedy, you know, <laughs> she would, she was comedy, but at the same time, she was a force to be reckoned with. And so it, it was just, it's amazing to watch. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to James Bond, isn't it usually like the, some, some older British gentleman who's putting together all the gadgets? <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. And she was young. Yeah. So the yeah. age thing. Absolutely. And, you know, they even talked about that. Oh, you have some young girl controlling your technology. You know, they, that was one of the digs one of the other tribes tried to say about them, but it was still part of their strength and their power. What did you think of this idea of the, I'm curious with the background in communications and divinity, what did you think of the moral dilemma that was put in the film of whether or not Wakanda should intervene in business outside of Wakanda? Or, I mean, I know you can see Killmonger's point of view, but did you see Wakanda's point of view, the value in that, in refraining, or what came to your mind? Absolutely. And I think that it's it's tough, because I even was thinking about this earlier today, watching news about the Russian-Ukraine war Mm -hmm. um, and and how the United States has given billions of dollars to this effort. And so it's a part of me that's like, oh, that's great because they need the help. But it's another part of me that said, well, where was that money when we needed support for education? And where was that money when we needed, (laughs) you know, so many other social causes in our own country, but the money doesn't exist, but now all of a sudden it exists. How much is our investment? Why, Why are we investing so much? I think over the last few years, particularly since COVID, I've become a little more, I don't know the right word to say. I don't want to say critical, but I'll say observant about how we respond to crises and issues in our country. I won't say that one response is better than the other, but I will say it's just interesting to see how resources pop up at certain times rather than others. So to go to your original question about, you know, of course I understand Wakanda's perspective because T'Challa was raised in a way 
in Wakanda for years has set, they set up that system to work for them, you know, to, to protect them, to keep them safe. They recognized that the world was what the world is, and they wanted to create a society apart from that where they can function and flourish without necessarily being taken advantage of like so many other African nations have, where they can participate in the world stage, but at the same time not have to deal with a lot of the issues of the world, you know? And so it's kind of like, like they created a sanctuary within the world. But then that also, you know, you do have that social responsibility that Killmonger would be more in line with because he grew up in Oakland and he saw poor people. And he's, you know, he has an African-American, you know, mother, grew up learning about those histories and those cultures and about the middle passage and about slavery and about oppressive systems in the United States and around the world. And his idea of it is going to be different. There's no way that it can't be, but it, it, it's just very interesting. I don't have an answer for it, but I definitely understand both perspectives. And I think that's when we have to lean in and have these difficult conversations that I believe a lot of us aren't having right now. Typically, if you look at media right now, you hear two extremes, but the people in the middle are silent. I think it's time for the people in the middle to stand up and say something, but typically it's like, well, what do I say that won't be looked at as wrong, <laughs> you know? And so we're allowing extremes to control the narrative and the decision making and, you know, how we move forward. Sometimes it's not a right answer, but we just have to find the an answer and just hope that great outcomes are the result. Or if we don't get good outcomes, that we still can adjust and try to make a difference. Yeah. Have, do you, are you familiar with Peter Singer's work by any chance, the utilitarian thinker? heard about it. I haven't okay. invested much in it yet. I think it was, I think it was in the seventies. He wrote this paper where he was talking about, and it reminds me of the dilemma in the film where he was talking about if somebody is well-dressed and wealthy and they pass by a pond and they're in a rush and there is a drowning baby in the pond, would it be wrong for that person to keep walking? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, right? You have to stop. Okay. You're going to get your shoes dirty. So there's a cost. Right. You're going to be late. There's a cost, but saving the baby, the baby's life is of more value than your shoes are being late. And right. his point with that was to demonstrate that you can maximize suffering or do wrong by doing nothing, that yeah. that in of itself is an immoral act. He's been, you know, one of the criticisms, of course, when you go and look at the paper, I, I don't know if it's a criticism, but it's a need for clarification. And I always wonder this, let's just say you do pick up the baby from the pond and put it to the side and then you turn around and you look at the pond again, and there's another baby. And then you pick up the baby and then, okay. And then there's another baby. At what point is that? And Peter Singer is not clear on that. And I'm almost wondering if that was part of the conflict that was presented in the film, where, like you said, it's not obvious of how, okay, we know we want to do good, but how much do you do good at the point where you're not being vulnerable where you can somehow maintain your life, but take care of others. But I would imagine that somebody like Killmonger would, after growing up around suffering and seeing suffering, would look at the wealthy and say, where were you? You could have done something and you didn't do anything. Particularly when this is his family, when it's his family that left him behind after killing his father, you know, <laughs> like this is his family that left him as an orphan where his dad died in his arms and they left. So not only is this institutional trauma, but this is family trauma as well. You know, and so it's really deep for him, <laughs> like really, really deep for him of this thing of you have to make something right. You know, you have to do something right. And of course, once again, T'Challa had no knowledge of any of this. He didn't even know that this cousin, his first cousin existed or what his dad did, <laughs> you know, or anything. You know, this opens up his world in a way that he never thought or expected and made it feel like, well, maybe we do need to make do something different. Maybe we should make some changes. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of that social conscience. And, and even when I was watching this film, I kept thinking about like, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., you know, those two different ways of addressing kind of the same issue, or even uh, Magneto and Professor X in X-Men, kind of those two consciousness <laughs> of kind of the same type of situation. It's like, okay, this group has this way of dealing with it. Another group has another way of dealing with it. And so in many cases, they just try to stay out of each other's way and move forward until the moment that they have to come together. And um, is it going to be a clash? Are they going to fight each other or are they going to work together? So, you know, it's just interesting how these storylines kind yeah. of repeat yeah. in film as well as in history. You know, John Lewis's memoir, I I have completely blanked on the name of it, mm -hmm. but he mentions Malcolm X a couple of times. Malcolm X is almost like a, it's kind of interesting. It just kind of comes in from the side and John Lewis met Malcolm X twice 
in his life at radically different times. One where we think of Malcolm X in the more, more of a militant fashion as, he, as different from Martin Luther King. And then the second time he met Malcolm X, it was actually closer to his death. And it, Malcolm X had done more traveling and it had altered his view a bit. Yeah. And so John Lewis describes that. And now it's making me think of what you said about T'Challa, about also appreciating that the good life that he was experiencing, that there might be some secrets behind that and that not being afraid to learn that would also open one's worldview that right. you have to understand. That. So if you've got some luxury, there might be a hidden cost there that you're not aware of in order for you to have that luxury. Right. Yeah. Gosh, that's like, yeah. <laughs> and you're you know making I mean? me think about this. <laughs> like, I mean, but how, how many people in our society need to have that revelation? The benefits that I live in mm -hmm. is a result of something that that absolutely bad that happened years ago that I may have not been a witness to. I may not have experienced yet. I benefit from things that happened in the past. It's not to say that acknowledging it corrects it, not to say that acknowledging it even changes my situation or takes anything away from me, but sometimes acknowledging it just helps to better help us to engage others who might have not been a beneficiary of that particular issue um, and help us to understand how we should engage the world and not look at other people like, oh, it's something wrong with you because you don't have what I have or you're not where I am. But understanding that there are systems in place that created this, you know, that there's history that happened that made these things come to be. So not only is Killmonger not clearly a villain, but T'Challa isn't clearly a hero. And from my perspective, from my perspective. I, oh my gosh. <laughs> I think this is one of the differences between this film and other superhero films is that other superhero films seem to rely on individualism and a personal moral dilemma that the person overcomes. Whereas one of the things that Black Panther does quite beautifully is it interlaces all of the factors that make somebody somebody, even though I think Killmonger is still responsible for his choices, right. at least the film, and same thing with T'Challa, but the film exposes that those choices are made in the throes of a variety of socioeconomic culture. Ah. Yeah, it's deeper. <laughs> and, and the thing that you, that a point that came to my head as you were just speaking was, you know, African cultures are very communal. So when we talk about he, the he, heroic nature, allowing one person, particularly a male, to be, in this particular instance, to be the hero would not give credence to the culture because the culture was definitely communal. And it was a communal effort that brought about that victory and brought about Wakanda to quote unquote being saved at that time. I wanted to see, this is actually more of a technical question. Um, let me find <laughs> okay. it. So, because it was um, for the people, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Where you looked up, it's more of a technical. So it's the one, the table of what makes somebody okay. a hero or a villain. How many things have to be true? Do all eight things need to be true for the person to be characterized as a villain? I don't remember exactly how I decided, but. Or at least. <laughs> Two of them are not true. So two things that make, according to the chart, two things that make a villain a villain was greedy. And he definitely wasn't. I thought that was so, you're right. And then the other thing was utterly selfish. So he did not have those two character traits, which is in part what makes it difficult. Let's see, what about associated with dark cleverness? Associated with dark. That's just a standard character-driven type of analysis that constitutes a villain. So we have, yeah, so yes. I pulled this list from like several different definitions of hero and villain. And so I just pulled out some of those characteristics based off of those definitions. What do you mean about associated with dark? Well, so when it talks about villain associated with dark, dark can mean a lot of different things. But, you know, I think it more so means like evil, you know, they have that darkness, that side to them that wouldn't necessarily be positive. And so I think here when we're talking when we're talking about Killmonger, and of course I wrote this years ago, but I believe that when I when I said this, it was that part of him that was unhealed. It was that part of him that was that rage, that anger, that part of him that would do harm in the place that, you know, many of us have that we don't want to deal with, you know, some of our stuff that might send us to therapy, but we don't want to go to therapy for, you know, but just kind of that trauma and that those issues that bring us to those dark places. Pretty sure that that's what that had to do with. I'm going to tap into the, the divinity scholar in you Okay. Uh, for clarity. <laughs> what is evil? Um, because I am kind of thinking that with Killmonger, there's a distinction or something that's highlighted is a distinction between evil and wrong. So I would 
I would argue that his okay. intentions were actually good, but the methodology was wrong. And that's what makes him complicated and not evil. I think if those two things were aligned, he could be considered evil. But from uh, the divinity scholar in you, what constitutes evil versus wrongness? I think I think you were, I think you got it. But I, th- I think the thing to evil for me is more so out of origin, core, as well as uh, motivation. What is the motivation behind our behavior? And so I think some of those lead, lead to evil. But I think when we're speaking more of a, from a divinic standpoint, it's, you know, we want to talk about the devil um, <laughs> or some type of evil force that drives motivation and drives being toward things that oppose light, which is typically known as being goodness, and love, and those types of things. So probably things that don't act out of love. Um, but I think that, you know, once again, Killmonger did have love. He, I don't think he exhibited in the same way that we would look at it in that friendly, happy, feel-good type love. You know, I think love motivated his actions in a different way because his love was also often associated with pain and heartbreak. Mm-hmm. I want to. Yeah, I think you did a great job talking about. It. <laughs> <laughs> I think you. I think you, you. I think you framed it well. You know? Do you know the the Stanford Prison Experiment? No. Oh, that um, Philip Zimbardo, he's a social psychologist. And in the 70s, he did this prison experiment where he had college students volunteer to either act like they were a prisoner or act like they were a guard. And then he would just watch what happened for two weeks. He had to stop the experiment after six days because it got so out of control. But one of the things that always struck me was he says, I wanted to see what happened to good people in an evil place. Now, of Mm. course, that's a completely unethical experiment because the only way to test that is to put good (laughs) people in an evil place. Right, right. But the fact that he called it evil, and then when I watch the experiment and read about it, is that evil, it seems from his point of view, and I can't stop thinking about it. It's almost, it's not a thing in itself, but it is a disregard for humanity where a human is literally treated as an object. And Mm. when I think about that definition of evil and applying it, it seems to be the case. Like I would say, even with, you know, we mentioned um, George Floyd's murder that in that case, what makes that evil? And it was a complete disregard that there was a human being suffering, not seeing a person as a person. So I've been thinking about that in that way. Rudy and I went to Catholic school, so we got our dose of. Um... <laughs> oh, yeah, it's it's funny. I'm I'm glad Gwen brought up that point about Catholic school. And uh, Rudy was an we, altar boy. We, we, we I, I wasn't was, allowed when I was, I was young. <laughs> you know, I, and and I'm so sorry. As as I mentioned, one of the reasons why I'm so quiet today is I'm at a funeral, and it was a funeral at a Catholic church, mm. and it was it was very it was very odd for me today because it, it was just before you go up and you get communion, you know, you're supposed to go in and you're supposed to confess your sins, you know, act of contrition. And th- this priest, for the first time in 30 years, I, I this priest reminded the crowd, oh, by the way, before you come up and get the Eucharist, make sure that you've actually done an act of contrition. And I didn't go up and get the, uh, I, I didn't go up and do communion. And it was, I was at a point where I, I felt like, I don't know, felt really, really bad. I, I, I don't know why I chimed in at this point, but it was, I, I don't know what, I don't know what, what branch of divinity you're, you're of or what you, you've studied. I don't know what you know about the Catholic Church, but there's a lot of rituals and things about it that, um, that I, I don't know. I, 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 it's hard to explain to non-Catholics what it's like to have gone to Catholic school their whole lives. I, I don't know what you know about the Catholic rituals. Only what I've seen on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. So. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Well. The, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. I, I'm telling you, it's. It's. It's very ritualistic, and uh, sometimes if you don't pro- follow all the proper rituals, you feel on the outside, and, and I kind of felt on the outside today, and. I don't know if that's a good thing to feel the connection towards the divine. I, that was just my two cents there. Mm. I think Rudy, if you, the, the priest said, you can't come up and have this unless you had an act of contrition. <laughs> I think I would have gone up there. <laughs> I would have been too embarrassed. I would have, been, well, I would because, have committed to sin. Your, <laughs> yeah, well, that's because you don't, that's because, you know, you, I'm not saying anything. I'm not calling you out. You have certain belief systems. <laughs> I have, I'm much more on the, I'm much more on the traditional, you know, one-sided view of everything. I literally didn't go up because he said that. Isn't that incredible, Gwen? I don't Did know. Did you just I, twiddle I, your thumbs while everyone walked past you? Yes. Yes. And people looked at me. <laughs> they did. Yeah. And, and that's I when know. I'm glad I'm a Protestant. I, well, <laughs> I think, you know, in Catholic Church, when people, people go up, you know, to take the Eucharist and then, uh, you know, you'll see these families of like, 
parents and then there are 2.5 kids or 1.5 kids. And then every once in a while, you'll see parents with their like eight kids behind them. And you know, those are the believers. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the ones who took it all seriously. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Rudy, I'm sorry. I don't mean to (laughs) pick on you. Well, I want to, gosh, I know there was, oh, I know what, one more thing, if we can, if we can wrap up with this. Did you share this essay with your students? Okay, so I have. I think I shared it the semester that it was published, but I'll I'll, I'll go back and tell you like kind of how this evolved. Okay. Well, of course, I um, started writing the paper, and initially, I think I titled it something about the villainization of Black masculinity, right? And one thing we learned in our in our scholarly endeavors is, you know, when you say something like that, it's kind of all encompassing. I submitted it to a journal and it was rejected and they gave me feedback. And of course my feelings was hurt. Cause I was like, this is good. This is good work. How <laughs> dare you. But it did challenge me to go back and um, reframe it. Right. And to think about it um, on one hand, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm not going to you know, worry about it. But um, what was it? 2019, right before, I think it was 2019, 2020. Was it 2020? 2020. It was 2020 right before the lockdown. Um, Black History Month, one of our assistant deans from my college asked me to present this work for the students on campus um, as part of our Black History series. And I told her, I was like, well, no, I'm not dealing with that. I'm not going to worry about it. She's like, no, I think this is going to be good. It's going to draw a crowd. You know, it's a great topic. You know, from what you share with me, I think it's going to be really good. I was like, okay, fine, whatever. So when I sat back down with it and I looked at the comments and the feedback, you know, I think that that aspect of hero versus villain came out when I looked at it again. And so... Uh, when I did my presentation on campus, it was well attended. Like it was, it was a, a room full of people, and I was kind of shocked. Like, oh my god! Like even the dean showed up, and everybody else like, okay, let's do this. Long story short, that was the time where I really got to feel good about the work again. It kind of lit a, a fire back in me. Well, that exercise brought about publication that you see now because I had to go back and reframe it and rework it and really present it. For me, I think because I am a teacher at heart. By me packaging it for students, it better package it in a research form for me, you know, because I was able to better communicate and articulate it for audience. You know, the students had, they gave great feedback to me. They asked very challenging questions to me that I hadn't thought about, uh, which is really good as an exercise. Essentially, this actually came out of a student experience um, really? and it encouraged me to Um, resubmit it to a different journal and get it published because I actually decided I was done with it and I was going to work on some other projects. So I'm excited that, you know, me having taken this information back to my, back to the students in my college in that Black History Forum really led to, you know, me revising the paper and getting it published. And since then, I've had several opportunities to speak about it and people have called me. So, you know, it's just like the gift that keeps on giving, even though I gave up on it at one point. So yeah, I got to give a shout out to those students who were there to help push it forward. Is there a different response that you have from Black students versus non-Black students or just in general? I guess we'll know, maybe we shouldn't generalize, but is there something that's different in what people get out of it? I think from the that particular presentation, from that particular presentation, it was a pretty consistent. It was like, well, wait, I need to go back and watch this again. <laughs> I think that was everybody's initial response, like, hold up. I think you're right. Let me go. (laughs) Like, I need to go see it again. And so um, I was able, you know, that that was kind of the consistent response from some of the students, some of the black students that did come to me. Some of them were like, "Okay, thank you. I feel seen from other students that were not black. They were, you know, kind of like, you know, wow, I never thought about it like this. I really need to kind of rethink some things. I can't draw all conclusions. Of course, this is a reflection on one work, but it does bring about a lot of different conversations that we can have. One professor, she brought her class in, um, a film studies class, because they had kind of mentioned the film in their class, and they were looking at some kind of villain models, I believe, in her particular class. So they asked some really tough questions to me. (laughs) But um, I think that it was good for them, too, because they saw how complexities and the conflicts that I mentioned throughout the paper really present themselves, not just in the movie, but these are conflicts that we experience from a day-to-day basis throughout our cultures. I did have the opportunity to um, do a presentation for HBCU and Rock Hill, South Carolina, Clinton College for one of their forum series. And that was really interesting because I had a conversation with the president who was doing that forum and he asked questions and students were able to ask questions. And so it was just really interesting to get their responses as well and see how, you know, they also felt like, you know, it was 
a mischaracterization, but they didn't have, they didn't know the wording to put to it. And they kind of got to what I wanted to get to in the original paper, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have the substance to prove it, was that this depiction of Killmonger as a villain, it could actually impact how people see themselves. You know, like those college students that look like him, that are inspiring, that are smart. If they're like, okay, if if the world is going to look at me like a villain, then I might as well be one. Or students who don't get to see Killmonger, people that look like Eric Stevens on a daily basis, when they see one walk into their classrooms, how they treat him. Those are the things that, you know, I couldn't prove through the paper that could be sensationalized or idealistic in my head, but they brought about those conversations of this could be a, a real thing for me. Like this is, you know, that's my, that could be my brother. That could be my boyfriend. That could be whoever that is dealing with these challenges because media constantly represents guys in this way. And so it's just been very interesting conversations I've had with people along the way since I've published this paper as well. I love when something like this weaves together so many different ideas from different disciplines. I think that's one of, I mean, your paper really, to me, represents how important it is that if you want to get something out of, let's say, the film Black Panther more than entertainment, but what is it making us thinking about and things from good, evil, right, wrong, sociological issues, historical issues, and then just beautiful screenwriting and women issues (laughs) that we've got in there. It's just, it's really, really lovely. Yeah, I appreciate that. Darius, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gwen. I really appreciate the time to talk to you and make the connection. Hopefully it's not the last time we get to talk. No, no, no. (laughs) Darius, thank you for writing a wonderful paper. Thank you for your understanding with my absence. And and just thank you for everything, man. (laughs) I I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you some more too, Rudy, one day. Man, for sure. You got a lot. You and I, it's fine. I wanted to, one thing I wanted to chime in on was, you know, you kind of started your career out as a substitute teacher. And I did the same thing uh, after college. I was a substitute teacher. And uh, I, that really, that, it really, it really set me up for a lifetime of, of love for, for education. And I was almost going to make a funny joke and was going to say, well, of course you, you really got into divinity and praying and into God. You were a substitute teacher for Christ's sakes. Uh, the weird thing about little... it was I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> I loved it too, man. It was such oh, a great my job. <laughs> great. I suggest it to everybody. I really do. I mean, so we have a lot in common, for sure. <laughs> Rudy, you Absolutely. gotta study. You gotta study more philosophy, Rudy. It'll alleviate so much of that Catholic school guilt. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> if, if 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 it could teach me, uh, you know. Is that true? Will it really relieve the Catholic school guilt? Because I'm looking for something. I'm looking for answers. And, and philosophy, <laughs> philosophy does not give me answers, Gwen. But maybe you just convinced philosophy me. Philosophy creates more questions than answers. But it, it gets it's you to a curious. point. I know. To, I know. <laughs> it gets you to a point that you're okay in attention. It just, like you, I, just, you, you get to a point you just don't care anymore. It's just like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking. I still. I'm sitting here right now. I still feel guilty about the fact that I didn't wasn't able to do the act of contrition and everything. It's terrible. Terrible. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good is in the details is produced by Dr. Gwen Landolsky and Rudy Salo. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you're enjoying the show, scroll down to the bottom and hit that five star review. Or take a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag us on Instagram. Good is in the details pod. And if you'd like to sponsor a show or if you have any questions and want to reach out, you can contact us. Good is in the details pod at gmail.com. We're also on Patreon. If you want extra content and how to support the show, join our book club. We're at patreon.com slash good is in the details. Okay, until next time. Bye.